The second part uh, about relaxation, we're going to focus on uh, the relaxation uh, of two spins. Uh, in fact, the dipolar relaxation of two spins. And the reason we're going to do this is that this is the origin of the nuclear overhauser effect, which, as I said before, is extremely important in, um, uh, well, just the routine application of NMR in many areas. So remember we said that um, one spin uh, generates a local field at another, and this is what's called the dipolar field, if it's, a, if it's a pair of spins. And of course it's reciprocal, so if this spin generates a field at that spin, then the same as that one. So this is sometimes called the dipole-dipole interaction. So I'm going to show you that if we think about the longitudinal relaxation in such a system, uh, you can develop a set of equations called the Solomon equations, which describe how the magnetization in this system behaves uh, over time. And using those equations, you can then uh, divide, describe how the nuclear overhauser effect comes about. And then, having done that, uh, we'll look at how you actually uh, devise an experiment to measure the nuclear overhauser effect. So that's going to be what we're doing. So, if we have two spins, um, of course we've got four energy levels, just as we had in the very first presentation. And there they are, alpha, 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 beta, uh, beta, alpha, and beta, beta. And, uh, and I've also numbered them one, two, three, four, which might be helpful later on. And we saw that, for example, one, three is an allowed transition, it's one that you would see uh, in the spectrum. But that's not what we're interested in at the moment. What we're interested in is uh, whether or not relaxation processes can cause transitions between these energy levels. And in fact, one of the special things about the dipolar interaction is it can cause transitions between any two of these energy levels. So not only between one and three, which is the same as a spectroscopic transition, but it can also cause transitions directly between 1 and 4 and directly between 2 and 3. So dipolar relaxation basically connects all of these energy levels together. And it's that special feature which gives uh, dipolar relaxation uh, some unusual qualities. Each of these transitions, unfortunately, has a different rate constant associated with it. Um, and they're labelled in a particular way. Uh, they're called W, and then there's a subscript. So W1s, these are rate constants for processes in which the quantum number changes by 1. So actually, they're the same as the allowed transitions. And W2 is the one going from alpha, alpha to beta, beta, for which you remember delta M is 2. And W0 is the one that goes from alpha, beta to beta, alpha. Uh, which is the one where uh, delta M is zero. So this, uh, these relaxation rate constants are labelled according to the delta M value. And just to add further complications, uh, the two W1 transitions of spin 1, for example, uh, 1, 3 and 2, 4, these two rate constants are in principle different as well. And that's why they're called W1, 1 alpha, and W1, 1 beta. Uh, so even this rather simple system, consisting of uh, four energy levels, uh, because of the dipolar relaxation, they're connected together by rather a complex set of relaxation pathways. Nevertheless, what we can do is to describe how the populations of these energy levels will change uh, as a function uh, of time using exactly the same approach we did for a single spin. In other words, looking at the gain and loss processes, let's say, for example, for the level 1. So I've written dn1 by dt, and the first one that you come across is this one that's circled in red now, and that's the process that um, will lead to a loss of population from level 1. And that's why it's written with a minus sign. And uh, the rate constant is W1 to alpha. And again, it's written as the deviation of the population from the equilibrium value. And then you can see that the next term 
Uh, that is another loss term from level 1. And then finally, W2, uh, that's also a loss term from level 1. So these three terms are all uh, loss terms, and that's why they're all negative. Now you've got to think about the processes coming the other way. So for example, this green one, this takes population from level 2 down to level 0. And that's why it's written as a positive term. Um, and it's proportional to the re relevant rate constant. And note that it's proportional to the population of the level that it's coming from. So it's proportional to N2 minus N0. And then likewise, that's also a gain term from level 3, proportional to N3 minus N0. And finally, that term is a gain term proportional to N4 minus N40. So you could write one of these differential equations for every one of the levels, for 1, 2, 3, and 4, just by looking at the network of levels and working out the gain and loss mechanisms. And that ends up with a rather hairy set of equations. Now, we can render these into a simpler form by writing the magnetizations in terms of the populations. So, for example, I can write the spin 1 Z magnetization, which I'm going to write as I1Z, as N1 minus N3 plus N2 minus N4. And the reason I'm doing that is that the 1, 3 is, the is one of the spin 1 transitions, and 2, 4 is the other spin 1 transition. You can see that from this diagram. 1, 3 is a spin 1 transition, and 2, 4 is a spin 1 transition. So the total magnetization on spin 1 is N1 minus N3, and then N2 minus N4. And in the same way, you can write down uh, the Z, Z magnetization on spin 2, which is N1 minus N2 plus N3 minus N4. And it turns out you also need one more term, which is a sort of a difference term, which I'm going to write as 2IZ, I1Z, I2Z. And that's the difference of the population across the spin 1 levels or equivalently across the spin 2 levels. And you may remember when we were talking about product operators, I described 2I1Z, I2Z as a non-equilibrium population distribution. And in fact, that's what it is. This is the population difference that it corresponds to. And then you also need to introduce equilibrium values. Remember, we're doing the same thing that we did before. The superscript 0 means the equilibrium value. So I1Z0, defined in terms of the populations of the energy levels at, at equilibrium, and likewise I2Z0. In fact, 2I1Z, I2Z0 is also is actually 0 equilibrium. So if you introduce those definitions, into those four differential equations that I wrote, one of which I wrote on the previous transparency, and you lock yourself in a dark room for a long while, uh, you will come up with these equations. They're actually the same things, but they're just rewritten in terms of a different variable. There's nothing happened here other than we've switched the populations to the magnetizations. And you'll see, if you look at the first one, it says the rate of change of I1Z that's the rate of change of the, pop, uh, of the magnetization on spin 1. And there's a term that depends on the magnetization of spin 1. There's a term that depends on the magnetization of spin 2. And there's a term that depends on this difference magnetization. And likewise for I2Z. And notice it's I1Z minus I1Z0 and so on. And these rate constants, the R's, the sigmas, and the deltas, can all be related uh, to these W's that we had in the previous thing. So this is just a way of casting this problem in a way that's probably more useful to us because rather than thinking about the populations of the levels, we can think about the magnetization on spin 1 and spin 2, which tends to be a more natural way of doing things. Now, what does all of this mean? It all just looks like a load of symbols. So how about a diagram to help us? So this diagram is supposed to illustrate what these differential equations say. So look in the diagram, you've got I1Z, you've got I2Z, 
and you've got 2i1z, i2z. So these are the three kinds of magnetization you can have in this uh, system. So first of all, look at this term that's highlighted in red now, uh, rz1. Now this term, you, we can say, is just the relaxation of spin 1. It's just where the spin 1 is losing its magnetization just to the surroundings. It's described as the self-relaxation of spin 1. If you look at the other term, the one now highlighted in blue, this is a connection between I1Z, the magnetization on spin 1, and this special term, this population difference term, 2I1Z, I2Z. So what this means is, is that spin 1 sits there, and it may just lose its magnetization to relaxation. That's what the RZ term represents. But it may gain some magnetization from spin 2 through this sigma term, and it may also gain some magnetization from this 2IZ, I1Z, I2Z term through this delta 1 term. And that's what these uh, differential equations are actually saying. So what they're saying is uh, we've got these two spins, but they are not isolated. You know, what happens on spin 1 affects what's going on on spin 2 and vice versa. They're connected. And they're connected particularly via this sigma term. And this turns out to be absolutely crucial. Now, if we stick to only dipolar relaxation, then it turns out, thank goodness, that these two rate constants, delta 1 and delta 2, are zero. So those two arrows disappear, and we can now forget about this 2i1z, i2z term, because it's no longer connected to the i1z and the i2z. So that simplifies things considerably. So my Solomon equations then look a little bit simpler. Look at the first equation. You've got the first term, rz times i1z. That's just the relaxation loss from spin 1. And then you've got sigma 1, 2 times i2z. That's the feed from spin 2. And then if you look at the second one, you've got rz times i2z. That's the loss from spin 2. And then you've got sigma 1, 2, i1, z. That's the feed from spin 1. So this simplifies things uh, considerably. So the terminology we use to describe this is the following. These rate constants R, Z, we call these the self-relaxation rate constants. So R, Z, 1 is the self-relaxation rate constant for spin 1. Uh, R, Z, 2 is likewise called the self-relaxation constant for spin 2. And this term, sigma 1, 2, is called the cross-relaxation rate constant. Uh, between the two spins. Cross relaxation in the sense that it connects the two things. And uh, the cross relaxation process, sigma 1, 2, that's the one that connects the magnetization from spin 2 to spin 1 and vice versa. So this turns out to be uh, particularly important. Now I haven't really described to you how you would go about calculating any of these rate constants. So we used a lots of these W's for the rate constants between two particular energy levels. Uh, and then I showed you that combinations of these W's can be written as R's and sigmas. Um, and I'm not going to describe to you how you do this. I mean, there is a, a, a well-developed theory about how you can do this. And uh, if, you, if you read Art Palmer's uh, book, it tells you all about it in great detail. But if you look at any of the expressions you get, they actually all have a common form. And this is quite helpful to understand what this is. So if you calculate a rate constant between two energy levels, I and J, they usually have three terms. First of all, there's some kind of funny number. And it's usually 3 tenths or 7 or 484ths or some strange number. And that just comes from out, out of the quantum mechanics behind this theory. And then you get what I would call a magnitude term, which I'm going to call y squared. 
And this term depends on the strength of the interaction. So, for example, if it's the dipolar interaction, this term will just basically depend on the gammas for the two nuclei involved and the distance between them. And in fact, it always turns out to be proportional to the square of the local field uh, because of the way this works. So in fact, that four would give you a distance dependence of one upon r to the six in the case of the dipolar relaxation. And finally, you've got the spectral density term j omega i j. And this is the spectral density at the frequency that corresponds to the transition between the two levels. So you've got your level I and your level J, and then you look at the frequency of the transition between those, and you need to know the spectral density at that frequency. So that's what this uh, J omega I J is. So no matter what kind of relaxation it is, uh, these rate constants always have this form. Uh, there's always a quantum factor, a size factor that relates to how big the local field is, and then a spectral density term. And it's quite helpful to keep this in mind when you look at these expressions in books. So, for example, uh, these are the expressions that you'll find in any of the standard works for the W rate constants for dipolar relaxation. And if you look at them, you'll see that they all have exactly the form I said they did. There's a number, the first one is 3 fortieths, there's a magnitude factor, b squared, and you can see that b squared is proportional to the gyromagnetic ratios and also to 1 upon r to the 6th. And then there's a spectral density at the relevant frequency. So w1 superscript 1 is a transition of spin 1, so it's a spectral density at Larmor frequency of spin 1. And if you look at w2, it's 3 tenths b squared, and then it's j at the sum of the Larmor frequencies, because if you think about the transition 1 to 4, which is what W2 represents, it's a transition involving both spins flipping, and if you work out the energy gap, the frequency gap, it would be the sum of the Larmor frequencies. And W0 is the difference of the Larmor frequencies. So they're the W's. And remember that the R's are just written in terms of the W's. So the R's usually involve several terms because, for example, RZ is some combination of these W's. But it's still all the same thing, you see. There's a B squared term, which gives you the magnitude, and that's stuck out at front. There are all these funny numbers, and they just come from the quantum mechanics. And then there are all these spectral densities. So what this is telling you is that these relaxation rate constants depend uh, on the spectral densities and on these intensity factors. Now this cross-relaxation term is particularly interesting to us because what I'm about to describe is that this is the one that gives rise to the nuclear overhauser effect. So this term sigma 1, 2, the cross-relaxation rate constant, is the one I want to focus on from now on. And it's useful to think about this. Uh, let's first of all think about it in, in a homonuclear system. In other words, two protons. So that omega naught 1 and omega naught 2 are the same. So this expression for sigma 1, 2 actually begins to look a little bit simpler. It's got a term which depends on the spectral density at twice the Larmor frequency. That comes from the W2 process and a term that depends on the spectral density at zero frequency now, that's the W0. And the reason it's zero is it was originally the difference of the two Larmor frequencies, and that's now gone to zero. And what I want to do is look at what this term is in the case of the fast motion limit and the slow motion limit. Now, you remember the fast motion limit is when the correlation time times the uh, Larmor frequency is much less than 1. That would be typical of small molecules. And I showed you that in the fast motion limit, J is just 2 tor C, regardless of frequency. And if you put in J is 2 tor C, uh, it rearranges a little bit, and you get a nice simple expression for sigma 1, 2. And the key thing here is that it's positive. So this cross-relaxation rate constant is positive in the fast motion limit. 
If we go back to the beginning and do the same in the slow motion limit, you remember in the slow motion limit, J0 is still 2 tor C, but the other one, the J at 2 omega naught, will be completely negligible. There is no spectral density at twice the Larmor frequency. So that first term, the W2 term, is essentially zero, and we end up with the cross-relaxation rate as minus a tenth B squared tor C. And the key thing here is that this is negative. So this cross-relaxation rate constant is positive in the, slow, in the fast motion limit and is negative in the slow motion limit. And so you won't be surprised to find that somewhere in between, zero. And if you calculate it out uh, fully, you get something like this. I've calculated this for a Larmor frequency of 500 megahertz. To start with, the cross-relaxation uh, rate constant is positive and it increases to a maximum. Then it goes through zero and then it goes negative. So the fast motion region is on the left and the slow motion region is on the right. And you can easily work out that the crossover point is when omega naught tor C is root 5 over 4, rather strangely. And for example, at 500 megahertz, that would correspond to a correlation time of 360 picoseconds. So it would be a sort of a medium-sized to biggish molecule. This cross-relaxation rate constant would actually go through zero. But it's positive for small molecules and negative for large molecules. And that turns out to be quite important in uh, the nuclear overhauser effect, which is exactly what we're going to look at now. So the whole point here um, is that if you look at this Solomon equation uh, for the behavior of the Z magnetization of spin one, you remember what it says. It says two things. It says that the, uh, I want the magnetization just fritters away that's what the first term says. But it also says, and most importantly, that if spin 2 is not at equilibrium, the magnetization on spin 1 will be affected. Now, you see, if spin 2 is at equilibrium, if I2z was equal to I2z0, then that red term would be 0 and nothing would happen. But if I2z is not at equilibrium, then that red term is not zero and there will be some change in the magnetization on spin one. But this will only happen, of course, if this cross-relaxation rate constant is not zero. And the nice feature is that almost exclusively the only kind of relaxation for which this sigma 1, 2 is not zero, is dipolar relaxation between spins. So if you discover that sigma 1, 2 is not zero, and we'll see how you do that in a moment, that implies there must be dipolar relaxation, and that implies the two spins must be reasonably close. And of course that is how the nuclear overhauser effect is used, because the nuclear overhauser effect is basically how we detect this, and therefore we say, if there's a nuclear overhauser effect, the spins are close. So this is what the nuclear overhauser effect is. And this Solomon equation basically tells us how to do the experiment, because all it says is, I need to perturb spin 2 away from equilibrium, and see what happens to spin 1. And if spin 1 doesn't change, that means sigma 1, 2 is 0, and there's no cross-relaxation and no nuclear overhauser effect. But if it does change, it means there is cross-relaxation and there is a nuclear overhauser effect. So the simplest kind of experiment you could do to detect this would be something like the following. You do one experiment where you apply a selective 180 degree pulse only to spin 2. That means you put a weak field on, you invert the magnetization on spin 2, but you leave spin 1 alone. So that's called a selective pulse. So we've done what we said we wanted. Spin 2 has been driven away from equilibrium. Now we wait a time tau, 
and we wait for that cross relaxation term to feed some magnetization from spin 2 to spin 1. And then after we wait a bit, we do a 90 degree pulse and look at the spectrum. What you usually do is then record a reference spectrum during which you don't do anything other than just do a pulse acquire. And that will give you the normal intensities. And then what you do is you take the difference between these uh, and the difference spectrum is very good at revealing any changes. So for example, if there's no cross relaxation, spin 1 will have exactly the same intensity in both spectra and when you look at the difference spectrum it disappears. So there's no effect. If there has been a change of intensity due to cross relaxation, that will appear in the difference spectrum. So this is the basic idea. Perturb one of the spins from equilibrium, leave a time and then see what happens and you usually reveal it by using a difference experiment. Now you can analyze these experiments using the Solomon equations and to do that you would have to integrate the Solomon equations and unfortunately they are two coupled first order differential equations and they're not that difficult to integrate but on the other hand it's not entirely straightforward it's not a one-liner so in the book you'll find that I integrate these using what's called the initial rate approximation which makes it a bit easier to do uh, and is valid for short times. Um, so you can look at that and what you end up with is something fairly straightforward. Uh, the Z magnet, if you look in the table, the Z magnetization on spin 1 has got two terms in it. There's a term which is uh, the equilibrium magnetization, I1Z0, and then there's a term that we're interested in, which is the term now highlighted in red, and this is the term which arose from cross-relaxation from spin 2. You see it goes as sigma 1, 2, the cross-relaxation constant, times tau. When you have the uh, reference experiment, of course the magnetization is just I1Z0, just the equilibrium magnetization. And all that we do is then turn these magnetizations into intensities because what you're going to do is a 90 degree pulse and then measure the intensity of the signal and the intensity is proportional to the Z magnetization so the intensities would be that. So when you took the difference experiment you would see that. So again, if you look there at the term highlighted in red, this is just saying that if there's a cross-relaxation, there will be a difference in intensity between the first spectrum and the reference spectrum, and that difference is proportional to the cross-relaxation rate constant. So if you want to see it in a sort of a highly schematic way, it would look something like this. I've done the selective inversion on spin 2, so when I look at the spectrum I see a positive peak on spin 1, an inverted peak on spin 2. When I look at the reference spectrum I see uh, two positive peaks, and then I take the difference spectrum, uh, the, the inverted peak goes double negative, and if there's a nuclear overhauser effect you see a small perturbation on spin 1. So this is usually called an NOE difference experiment. And if it's worked perfectly, all you see is the inverted signal, the one that was your target, and then you see a small signal, which is the nuclear overhauser effect uh, that's taken place. And it's normal to define a thing called the NOE enhancement, which is just the difference in peak height between the experiment and the reference experiment uh, then scaled with respect to the reference experiment and in this case you would find the NOE enhancement uh, was 2 sigma times tau. So first of all if sigma was 0 there's no NOE and remember sigma will only be 0 if there's dipolar relaxation. So the NOE is diagnostic of dipolar relaxation. The bigger sigma, the bigger the NOE, well, the closer the spins are, the bigger sigma and the bigger the NOE, so that's good news. And it also tells you that in this initial rate limit, uh, the NOE enhancement is proportional to tau. 
this is only an approximation. At longer times, the NOE enhancement reaches a maximum and then will actually decay away. So this is the first example of an experiment you can use to reveal the nuclear overhauser effect. Now, there's another way you can do this, which uh, used to be used quite a lot and isn't quite so popular anymore, but I think I'll describe this because it is still used in heteronuclear experiments. And so it uses the same idea, and that is that what you have to do is drive spin 2 away from equilibrium and then see what it does to spin 1. Uh, except this time you do it by irradiating spin 2 again with a weak field for a long time and the idea is you drive the magnetization of spin 2 to zero it's called saturation and then you keep it at zero by keeping on irradiating it so you sit on spin 2 with a weak field and you irradiate it for a long time and that keeps spin 2 saturated that means that the Z magnetization is zero. And again, you, uh, you have to wait for the steady state to be reached. That's when the magnetization stops changing. And then you acquire the signal. And as usual, you do a reference spectrum without saturation and compute the difference spectrum. And actually, the analysis of this is a little bit more straightforward. So there's my Solomon equation again. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to saturate, so I2Z goes to zero. So that term goes to zero. And then I'm going to say I'm going to reach the steady state. And you remember, steady state means that nothing is changing. So DI1Z by DT, the rate of change of IZ, has to be zero. So when I'm in the steady state, I have zero, and then this equation there. And notice that I2Z has gone away because it's set to zero by the saturation and notice I've written SS there to indicate this is the steady state value and you can rearrange that to give you the steady state Z magnetization as that and if you work through the algebra you'll find that the nuclear overhauser effect enhancement is sigma over R so it's the same thing you'll only see a nuclear overhauser effect if sigma is non-zero. Now the transient experiment, which is the one I described first with the selective 180 degree pulse and the steady state experiment I've just described, uh, they give different Overhauser enhancements. So look at the transient one. The transient one the Overhauser enhancement is proportional to the cross relaxation rate constant sigma 1, 2 uh, and is proportional to the time. The steady state enhancement is proportional to the ratio between sigma, the cross relaxation constant, and R, the self relaxation rate constant. And so the steady state one uh, is really the result of a competitive process between the magnetization arriving from spin 2 and being lost by self-relaxation of spin 1. And this is the reason that steady state NOE enhancements are notoriously difficult to interpret in a quantitative way because their value depends on the cross-relaxation term, which is the one you're interested in, and this self-term, which you don't, often don't really know about. Whereas the transient enhancement only depends on the cross-relaxation term. So that's why there's quite a significant difference between these two. Now, you can do this in a heteronuclear experiment, so, for example, if you've got two nuclei, I and S, say I might be proton and S might be carbon-13, you can irradiate the I spins and look to see whether there's a nuclear overhauser enhancement on the S spins. And in the steady state, you can work out uh, that the steady state NOE enhancement uh, depends on sigma over R as before, but it also depends on the ratio of the gammas, and this is because the equilibrium magnetization on the two spins is different. So, for example, if you took um, 
the uh, fast motion limit, so for small molecules, R and uh, sigma have a simple form, and you just end up with the steady state NOE as being gamma I over 2 gamma S. So what that means is, uh, in the case of proton and carbon-13, you would get an enhancement of a factor of 2, which is quite a lot. So this heteronuclear NOE depends on the ratio of the gammas as well. Uh, and this is also used um, when people are looking at uh, NOEs, say, between proton and N15 um, in a protein. Now, I'm just going to finish up by describing uh, one further experiment uh, which you can use to look at the NOE, and that's a two-dimensional experiment, which is the 2D nosy experiment, as it's called. Um, and this is used a great deal for visualizing nuclear overhauser effects um, in, in a two-dimensional way. And there's the pulse sequence, 90T190, and then a time, and then 90 acquire. And the way this works is, is that during time T1, uh, the spins evolve under their offsets at their shifts, and this means that the magnetization acquires a frequency label in the way that we've already seen. The second pulse rotates this labeled magnetization onto the z-axis, and then during the time tau, uh, you allow cross-relaxation to take place and during that cross-relaxation time, uh, magnetization will be transferred from one spin to another. Right? So you may start out with some I1Z, and due to cross-relaxation, it may get transferred to spin 2, and vice versa. And the key thing is that when the magnetization gets transferred, it takes the frequency label with it, so that the magnetization knows it started out on the other spin. And that's what generates the cross peaks. And then finally, uh, you do a pulse after a certain time to make the thing observable. Uh, and the point is here that the cross peaks arise due to cross relaxation. So this is analogous to COSY, except in COSY the cross peaks arise due to coherence transfer through a J coupling. In nosy, the cross peaks arise due to magnetization transfer mediated by cross relaxation, hence the nuclear overhauser effect. Now, the full analysis is written out in the book, and I'm not going to go through this. I'll just highlight the key points. If you have if you do 90T190, which is the first uh, part of the sequence, it generates Z magnetization, for example here on spin 1. Note the frequency label, cos omega 1 T1. That arises from the evolution during T1. Uh, and you'd get a similar thing uh, due to spin 2. And then you'd basically plug these into the Solomon equations, and again you need to integrate and again, that's easiest if you just use the initial rate approximation. And what you end up with is, again, really what you'd expect. If you look at that first equation, uh, there's I1Z. There's a term that depends just on the self-relaxation times C1, which is this cos omega 1 term. And then there's a term that depends on the cross-relaxation constant, and that's times C2. Uh, which is, depends on omega 2. And that's the transferred magnetization that comes over with its frequency label. So when you look at the uh, apply the final pulse, you find that there are three observable terms on spin 1. And these three things correspond to different quantities. So the first one of these is a diagonal peak. Now, I know it's a diagonal peak because all these terms are observable on spin 1. And the modulation is at cos omega 1 T1. So this is a diagonal peak. And notice that the intensity of the diagonal peak is 1 minus R tau. And that doesn't depend on the cross relaxation. So there's always a diagonal peak regardless of whether or not there's any cross relaxation. The next peak is a cross peak. How do I know that? It appears on spin 1, and the modulation in T1 is omega 2 T1. 
So this is a cross peak. And its intensity depends on the cross relaxation rate constant sigma. So this peak will only appear if uh, the, the sigma is non-zero. So only if there's cross relaxation, hence the nuclear overhauser effect. And then the third term, this is actually called an axial peak. We haven't come across this yet, but notice that it appears on spin 1, but it has no modulation as a function of T1. And therefore it will occur at little omega 1 equals 0, along the omega 1 equals 0 axis, which is why it's called an axial peak. And in fact, this arises as a result of magnetization which simply recovers during the mixing time. And that magnetization, because it's recovered as a result of random relaxation, has lost its frequency label. So that's the axial peak. So if you look at your spectrum, uh, here it is rather schematically, the three terms, this term is your diagonal peak, at big omega 1 in each dimension. This term here is the cross peak at omega 2 in the little omega 1 dimension and omega 1 in the little omega 2 dimension. And then this is the axial peak shown in blue which comes out at omega 1 equals 0. And the intensity of these three peaks depends on R and sigma. These axial peaks are an absolute pain, I mean, because they sit there in the middle of the spectrum, and particularly if you use long mixing times, they can become quite strong. So it's usual to suppress them, uh, and uh, you should now be uh, entirely confident in predicting how you would do this. If I change the first pulse from x to minus x, then all of the peaks I'm interested in will change sign because they all come from that first pulse. But the axial peaks don't change sign because they don't originate from the first pulse. They originate from relaxation during time tau. So all you do is do a difference experiment and that cancels off the axial peaks. So just to finish up, this is a, 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 a nosy spectrum of a small molecule. Um, I can tell it's a small molecule because the diagonal and cross peaks have opposite signs. Uh, and that's characteristic of small molecules. Large molecules, the diagonal and the cross peaks, have the same sign because sigma is negative. And you can see the diagonal peaks there in black and a whole range of different cross peaks there in blue. So this is very complementary to nosy. The cross peaks indicate NOEs, that means close contacts as opposed to cosy, where the cross peaks indicate J-couplings. And that brings us to the end of that section. Thank you.